Thank you for coming. My name is Jeff Myers. I work at the Mayo Clinic up in Minnesota. Um, we have the Cancer Center Statistics team where I've been working there for just about nine years, focusing on macros, graph template language, SQL, and making reports. Today I'm going to be talking about a fun project that I've worked on at Mayo Clinic in our biomedical uh, informatics and statistics teams. We have a large group of R users and we have a large group of SAS users, and we can be a little bit competitive with each other. And once in a while, we have project speeches where we do a combined uh, presentation in the style of anything that you can do, I can do better. And this last time, we did it with graphics, where we could talk about the new SG graphics procedures or ggplot2 for them. And part of that talk was giving each other challenge plots. So finding something that we would think the other uh, group would have problems with making, giving it to them, and seeing what they can do and seeing how they would actually make it. It was during this where I learned what an actual circus plot is, because it's something I've never personally used or heard of. And I had so much fun trying to make it that I had two weeks to do it, and instead I tried to write the code in the span of about 6 p.m. till 4 in the morning, because I got to go back to my old trigonometry and mathematics roots, and it was just a fun time. So I managed to convert it into a macro, and I thought the process that I went through in actually making the macro and writing the code could be found useful for others, so I decided to go around and present this. I gave this talk at Pharmazoc last year and was invited to give it again here. So without further ado, what is a circus graph? So again, something I've never heard of. It is a circular graph that shows the, it's a visual depiction of connections between groups. So in this picture here, we have 10 different groups. We have curves that start from one group and move to another. They're used primarily in genomics or genetic graphs to show how different pathways are transforming. Um, from my research of it, and since I'm not really the expert on these, is that there's kind of four main components. There's an outer circle, there's an inner circle, there are Bezier curves, and there are axes and labels. And from the graph, it's basically just a visual representation of your data. It's not really quantitative, to say the least. So walking through each of the pieces, this is what I call the outer circle. Um, these are curved rectangles that go around. The length of the rectangle is proportionate to the sample size. So if we were looking at this, we could easily tell that our red group in the bottom left corner is much smaller than, say, our light blue group in the upper right corner. We don't know quantitatively or numerically how much smaller it actually is, but we know proportionate to our total uh, sample size, it uh, represents quite a few less paths. The inner circle that I have is represented a number of paths that are currently leaving that group. So if we look at our bottom three groups, the blue, red, and green on the left, because the bar completely matches the outer circle, we know that every single path is leaving that group and we don't have any paths that are entering that group. For the last three in the bottom right, we know that all the paths are leaving and there's nobody that's actually entering those groups. For all the others, it looks like they're pretty well balanced with the exception of maybe the top group that where two thirds are leaving and a third are entering. So Bezier curve was another type of uh, curve that I had never heard of and I was actually trying to make these without knowing what it was and until I got the hint of what it was actually called, I wasn't able to actually solve how to make one. Um, they are the curves in the middle of the graph that are connecting one group to another. The width of the curve actually changes from it, where it starts to the middle to the end. They get a little skinnier and then potentially get a little bit wider. Um, the color that I have on them is, matches the, where they originate from. So if you look at where they're entering, like in the bottom right corner, you know that that purple bar is coming from the purple group without having to trace the line back. The curves are kind of pulled towards the center of the circle to make that arc. The longer that the pathway is, the closer to the center of the circle that it gets. Now, the actual widths of them are determined by the proportions of the paths at their start and, and where they uh, finish, their end point. So, for example, if they're leaving the red group and entering that purple group, we're going from the red sample size to the purple sample size, 
so the proportion of that path, so if the path is, say, 40 patients or something, that 40 out of the red group is going to be a different proportion of the red group than the 40 out of the purple group. So the width where it starts and the width where it ends will wind up being different. So axes and labels, I added these into this. I don't normally see axes on these when I Google search them, but I really like having something quantitative in graphs so I can put numbers to it. Um, so these axes have major and minor tick marks. The major tick mark represents 5% uh, of the total population. The minor tick mark represents 1% of the total population. And the labels I have are rotated to face the center. So now, in my examples, I like to put in the total number of paths that each percentage represents, and I can easily go to a group and count left to right in this example by fives and get what percentage of my sample size is in that group. Labels are, in this example, labels are uh, rotated in order to face the center. I can also have them just go straight horizontal if that's preferred. So that is what a circus plot is. Now, what did I have so much fun doing in order to actually make this graph? Because there's currently nothing in SAS that can actually make pretty much anything that we just saw. And the answer is trigonometry. So hopefully we can all kind of remember our trigonomic roots. This is called the unit circle. So it's simply just a circle with radius one centered at zero, zero on the x, y axis. It's, easily, it's easy to calculate distances with sine and cosine functions. A full rotation around the circle is 360 degrees or two pi radians, starting with the x-axis as the reference, so from zero, zero to one, zero is kind of where the reference line is for radians. And it's important to note how to convert to radians because the sine and cosine functions in SAS run off of radians and not percentages. So not as much fun to deal with as percentages, but it's what we have to do. And I use the polygon plot. So the polygon plot lets us plot different x, y coordinates, which then get connected together. And once they reach the, the same endpoint that it started from, it fills in that polygon to give us a shape. It's a pretty straightforward one to use. This is the graph template language code. It's, I think it's just called polygon and sgplot. We just need an x coordinate, a y coordinate, and an id variable. The id variable helps us distinguish unique objects. And that id variable comes in very handy because we're going to have a lot of different shapes. And if we had to have a different set of x, y variables for each shape, that would be a very massive data set. This lets us put all of our shapes into one set of x and y columns and only have to really do one polygon plot call. So a number of polygon points. As you can imagine, trying to make a curve out of laying a bunch of points can be very difficult. The more points that you have, the smoother a curve gets. With three, as you can see, we make a triangle, which isn't very curvy. Five points, we get a little bit more there. Seven points, we're starting to make a little bit of an arc. I found in this macro, the default is set to 10 because with SAS, that kind of makes it uh, smooth without going overboard and then having thousands and thousands of observations in the plot data set. But this still wouldn't work unless SAS had this subpixel option. So in the graph template language, GTL, the option was added in 9.4 maintenance package three. It smooths jagged curves using subpixels. So the pixels in between pixels. It's necessary for this to work. I'm hoping this is visible. But with the subpixel on, we can see on the left, it makes our curved rectangles really smooth. If you look on the right hand side, we can see, especially in the bottom right corner with that green one, the curves become a little wonky, a little wavy. And so that subpixel option is probably the keystone that really lets this method work. So back to trigonometry. To go over our, our two basic trig functions, we have our x coordinate can be found by taking distance times cosine of our angle. And the y-coordinate is the same thing, but with the sine function. Using the unit circle, um, we always have that distance of 1 going from 0 to the outside of the circle. 
which makes the D uh, calculation there go away pretty much. And in this example, we're looking at pi over three radians, which gives us that point in the upper right. And so the x coordinate for that is cosine of pi over three, and the y coordinate is sine of pi over three. So now, actually drawing a curved rectangle, I do this using data step, do loops, and outputs. And so I have to run a do loop from our starting point to our ending point around the outside of the circle. In this case, I'm going from pi over three to pi over nine radians. If you were to actually run this in SAS, you have to use the constant function to get the pi value, but I didn't want to overload the text on this slide. So we're going from pi over three to pi over nine by the difference numerically in those divided by some count, where the division by some count is gonna say how many points we're gonna wind up having in that rectangle. For this example, I have five. You can bump that up to 100 if you have a really big group that you wanna make smooth. If you have some really small groups, you probably don't need a lot of points. It just comes down to how much memory and processing time that you wanna use for this. And so we're just gonna loop through those. We're gonna take one for our distance to the outside of the unit circle and take the cosine by whatever our i value is at the time and do the same thing with y, output that into a row, and we have our outer part. In order to get the inner part now, we have to walk backwards from what we did because if we go the same direction, pi over three to pi over nine, our, the end point of our outer circle is trying to, gonna connect to the starting point of our inner part of the bar and we're actually gonna make a hourglass kind of shape instead. So we need to make sure that we walk left to right at first and then we walk it back right to left to make the polygon plot work properly. So we just do the same thing. We come back. This time, we're gonna multiply that by 0 0.8. And this is how I can make quantitate, or quantitate how wide my bars are because it's just a percentage of the unit circle. So now these bars are 20% of the width of my unit circle. I can pop in any number that I want there to make them wider or skinnier, and it works just fine with my trig functions. Drawing the Bezier curves is a little bit more complicated. Um, there's actually, from what I found, multiple different polynomial levels for a Bezier curve, from linear, quadratic, cubic, um, quartic, and it just depends on how many points do you need to have in your Bezier curve. In mine, I have a starting point, P0, I have a midpoint, P1, and an endpoint, P2, so I'm using the quadratic Bezier formula, which gives me this equation, the one minus T squared of our starting point, plus two times one minus T times T times our midpoint, plus T squared times our endpoint, going from zero to one, where zero is just our starting point, and one is our endpoint, and everything in between is just a proportion of the distance between those. But luckily in our situation, P1 is always the center of the circle, which is zero, zero. So we can actually just get rid of that whole middle piece and simplify our formula to be one minus T squared times our starting point plus T squared times our ending point from zero to one. And we have to do this with both our X coordinates and our Y coordinates. So in this example, trying to color coordinate our starting endpoints with the, the cosine sine values in the code description. So our starting point is at two pi over three, which is the far left side and the top of that Bezier curve. I wish I had a laser pointer so I could point it out, but I'm hoping we can follow along. So the top left corner of our Bezier curve is two pi over three and I multiply that by 0.75 because I only want it to go out three quarters of the unit circle to give that gap between the rectangle. So we just go from zero to one by how many points we wanna have in our Bezier curve, and we do the same do loop process to get the top part of the curve. We use the same process to make our rectangles to make the side of the Bezier curve. Then we go back uh, the way we came in reverse uh, from our starting point to our end point, which looks to be about uh, pi over nine over to three pi over nine to make the bottom of the Bezier curve and then make the last edge. Connect them and then we have our polynomial, or our polygon. Drawing a curved axis. So a curved axis is also something that SAS doesn't currently have. 
And what I've done is I've taken what I've already done and I've hijacked it to make the axis. So what I mean by that is I'm gonna take the outer edge of the rectangles that make our outer circle. So if I go back, that blue rectangle, I'm gonna use the edge of that that makes, that's connected to the unit circle. And I'm gonna draw a series plot over that. In order to make the tick marks, I'm gonna again use series plots. This time, for each tick mark, I need to have two points. I need the point that touches the unit circle, and I need the point that extends beyond the unit circle. And I can control how long they are by just saying what percentage of the unit circle I plot them at. And I need to have one of those, tick, or I need two points for each tick, and I just need to go around the circle and draw all the ticks. And I can use my group option to then plot an individual series plot for each one of those tick values. So this is gonna look like a lot of code to read on a slide. Essentially, we're just going from one part of the unit circle, pi over nine, to pi over three. We have to convert this to percentages, so I'm dividing by two pi for this and just kind of drawing everything out without simplifying the math, because I wanna go by 1% steps. So in this, I'm converting to percentages. I'm starting at 2%, or I'm not, I'm not gonna draw a tick mark at zero, so I'm gonna start at 1% and draw the tick marks from there. And I'm just gonna go by 0.01 or 1% steps. My tick plus one is gonna be my group variable. So each time I go through this, tick will increase, give me a new ID variable that I can use to make a new tick mark. Our X coordinates and Y coordinates are again gonna be drawn with the sine and cosines, where we're just gonna draw them on the unit circle for the first point, and we're gonna output that. And this next section is looking at, is this the fifth tick? Because every five ticks, I wanna make my second point further away to make it a major tick mark instead of a minor tick mark. So if mod tick five is equal to zero, meaning that it is a fifth tick, then I'm gonna make it 1.025 or two and a half percent beyond the unit circle. If it's not, then I'm gonna only gonna make it 1.25% beyond the unit circle, so half is far out. So my major tick marks will always be twice as big as my minor tick marks. And it looks something like this. So if I go, Counterclockwise around here, I can count one, two, three, four, five tick marks. So each one of those has its own tick ID. We have two points, one on the unit circle, one that's a little bit further out. And we just make our way through each of the groups and draw those in. And from there, we use a series plot. And I mean, has everyone here used graph template language or primarily SGplot? Okay, so that eval function is a really handy tool. It lets you do a calculation on a column or a variable that you currently have in order to transform it into another without having to go back and remake it in your data set. In this case, I'm using the eval to run an if n, which does a logical step and gives something if true, something is false, kind of like an if else function. In this case, I have a flag variable that says this is my axis, so these coordinates go with the axis. If axis is one, then I take the x-coordinate. If it's not, I make it missing, and I don't plot those. For the other tick, mar for the tick marks, I do the same thing. I just have x is x tick, y is y tick with the series plot, and I group them on that tick identifier, so I get separate ticks. Drawing rotated labels. So with labels, I, I draw them with the text plot, uh, or text plot statement. I rotate them to face the center of the circle. For this, all you need is an x and y coordinate once again, which again, I use sine and cosine to do. Rotate, I have to use arc cosine, so I have to get the inverse of the angle I'm currently at uh, in order to get the angle to rotate the text. And the text variable is just whatever we want there, so our variable group, variable name, something to that effect. Then we just throw them into the text plot statement so text is text, x is x lab, y is y lab, rotate equals rotate, we have that. And the spot that I have to pick for my x and y coordinates is of course the midpoint of each group. So I have to calculate whatever halfway is between the blue and halfway is between the red and get the coordinates for those. So another very complicated part of this was how do I order these Bezier curves? 
Ordering where the curves start and stop is important for aesthetics and readability. You want to prevent the same group from crossing over itself too much because it just doesn't look clean. The closer groups should be connected first. And of course, this is one of the trickiest parts of making the circus graph. So here's an example looking at clean ordering versus messy ordering. On the left, if I focus on group one, the bottom there, I can see none of the curves cross over each other. They connect to the nearest ones first without reaching across, crossing over anything. Now in the messy ordering, if I look at the blue group, they're going every which way, they're crossing over each other. It just doesn't look as professional as the curve on the left. So the way that I do that is I take each group, so in this case this is group one, same as that blue group at the bottom of this curve, and I split it into three sections. There's an incoming section, which are paths coming from other groups, so group two coming into group one. There's paths that stay within the same group, so group one going to itself. And then there's groups that leave, so going from group one out to group two. I fill in the incoming bar from left to right, and I fill in the outgoing bar from right to left. Um, so let's say I'm focusing on group one. I want my outgoing group to start on the far right so that when it connects to the group immediately to its right, it starts on the far right of that group and it connects to the far left of the group next to it. So the staying bar is only, only has one potential path entering it, and I want that to be the final one that gets filled right in the middle so it doesn't cross over anything. So this is my algorithm that I made in order to sort these. This is from proc SQL and the order by statement. Which I really like using proc SQL for situations like this because you don't actually have to make variables to sort by. You can actually make code that does that. So this has three layers to it. The first layer is just is the group that it starts at different than the group that it leaves? If it's true, then it gets a value of one. If it's false, it gets a value of zero. So when you sort this, the zeros will come first and the ones will come last. So this is how I get my groups that stay the same to be drawn last. The second level is what's the starting group? So do we start at group one and we increase up two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and this is possible just because no matter what the groups are, if they're text, their character, the macro takes them and it assigns them in numeric order, so I don't have to worry about alphabetical or anything. But there's probably some kind of math algorithm out there that I could pick where do I start to get the least amount of crossover in my graph. Fortunately, this was just a fun project for me, so I didn't go that into detail, and I just had to pick somewhere to start, so I picked with group one. So our last section is using the if end function again, and it's kind of a two-part deal. So it checks the logic statement, is the before group greater than the after group? So is the starting group more, greater than the ending group? So an example of this would be if you're in group two and you're traveling to group one, then that would be true. If you're traveling from group one to group two, that is not true. So when it, these are true, we start at we go to the before level minus the after level. So if we're going from two to one, two minus one gives us one. That's our number for sorting on. If it's not true, so if we're going from one to 10, for example, we would go to that last row. We would take one minus 10, which gives us negative nine. We would add our total number of groups and we'd get one. And that gives us our sort order. And the goal for this is I want our outgoing curves to go in reverse around the circle, so I want to connect to 10, then 9, then 8, and 7, 6, 5, 4, just so none of my curves cross over with each other. So here's an example of this with not 10 groups. Uh, if we look at our not sorted curve on the left, we'll notice that it just goes in whatever SAS gave me, we're going 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 around, our curves cross over, no real order. On the right now, we're going to go in order. So the first thing I want to do is look at one my, or when one connects to two. Uh, one is less than two, so if we take one minus two, we get negative one. If we add three, that gives us a value of two. 
However, if we look at 1 to 3, 1 minus 3 is negative 2, plus 3 gives us 1, which is why 1 connects to 3 first, and then 1 connects to 2, because we'd go 1, 2, 2. And same way all around the, the curve, when we look at group 2, 2 minus 1 gives us 1, so that would go first, versus 2 minus 3 gives us negative 1, we add 3, we get 2, so that would go second. And we get all the way around the curve, and we come back to 1 to 1, which is our seventh item, 2 to 2 is our eighth item, and 3 to 3 is our ninth item. So that's how we get the sort order based off that algorithm. So a little bit easier now, uh, data set structure. And this is not the structure of the data set that you'd have to use to run this macro. This is the data set, the structure of the data set that this macro makes to make the graph. So data set structure to make the polygons is this list of variables. So the BFR stands for before. So we have the before ID, and it's the ID of the starting path. So I always want to know what the starting path is for a Bezier curve because I want, to know, I want it to be colored the same as its starting group. The ID is a unique ID for each shape in the polygon plot, so it could be something arbitrary. In my examples, I have C1, so circle 1 is the first group's rec outer rectangle. B comma 1-4 is our Bezier curve connecting 1 to 4. So I just have the macro write out all these different IDs so that it can make them different shapes. Outline is my flag variable that says that these coordinates represent the outline of the unit circle for, the, uh, for our outer circle groups. Outer flags the coordinates for the outer rectangle. Inner flags coordinates for our inner rectangle. Bezier flags the coordinates as being part of the Bezier curve. And we have our x and y coordinates. So for the labels, we have our text variable, which just winds up being our group values. We have x text for our x text and y text for our x coordinates and y coordinates for our text plot. And we have a rotate variable, which lets us pick a rotation value for the text plot. This way I don't have to specify a different text plot for each label because I can pre-calculate the rotation here. For our axis tick marks, we have tick mark, which again is just a group ID. So some examples I have here are you know, colon 1-1. So there will be two rows where it's 1-1, one for the point on the unit circle, one for the point off the unit circle. And it will just go 1-1, 1-1, 1-2, 1-3, 1-4, and so forth for each group. Then increment up to 2-1, 2-2, and so forth then the x-tick and y-tick are just our x and y coordinates again. So now getting into the GTL code, again, graph template language code. The, the big bulk of doing this macro was the data step processing. The actual graph template language code should be fairly straightforward. Um, I think the most complicated part is right here in the attribute map. Um, if you haven't used an attribute map before, it lets you kind of specify uh, values almost like a format. So you can list off all your different values. And here I'm going from one to however many groups I have. In our example, it's been 10. So from one to 10, when value is one, give it the fill attributes, some color of your choice. So using the discrete attribute map, I'll assign these different attributes to each of the 10 groups. I'll name my discrete attribute map ATTRS which is similar to what you would, how you would name a format with proc format, so you can call it later. And it gets called by this discrete attribute, uh, discrete attribute var statement at the bottom here, where attr var is our new grouping variable that applies the discrete attribute uh, map. Our var is the variable that's gonna uh, contribute the values. So BFR ID is again, the ID of the group that our curve starts at, and the attribute map it's going to reference is the ATTRS map. So in order to draw the Bezier curves, I call the polygon plot, and again, I'm going to use this eval function, and I'm going to refer back to that Bezier flag variable that I made, because all of my XY coordinates are in two columns, whether it's my rectangles, my inner rectangles, my Bezier curves, they're all buried in there. And for this one, I only want to plot the Bezier curves 
because I need the transparency option. If it wasn't for the transparency option, I could do it all in one polygon plot statement, but unfortunately there's no variable I can add for a transparency value. The reason why I have the transparency value is because if the Bezier curves were not transparent, they would be completely opaque and they would just start covering each other up and it'd be a little bit harder to read the graph, or quite a bit harder to read the graph. To draw the rectangles, we do the same thing. This time I'm gonna say where Bezier is not equal to one to get all of the other shapes that are contained in those X and Y variables. And again, I'm gonna group on this ATTR bar in order to get the colors that I want. To draw the axes, I'm gonna use a series plot. I'm gonna pick out my X, Y coordinates that make the outline of the unit circle. I'm gonna set up my linear attributes using my macro uh, parameters, and I'm gonna group them on the ID variable so that I get a different series plot for each one of my groups going around the circle. If I didn't use that group equals ID, then the axis, when it ends on one of the rectangles, would draw a line to the next rectangle which would go around and draw a line to the next rectangle by using this group option. It just uh, stops at the end of each group. To draw the tick marks, I do another series plot using x equals x tick, y equals y tick, line attributes again, and this time I'm gonna use the tick mark as in our group so that I get separate tick marks. Again, if I didn't use this group value, each tick mark would connect to the next and make a bunch of jagged triangles going around the curve, or going around the circle, which is not what we want. Draw the labels, it's a text plot. So again, we have an X and a Y. We use our text value. We set our text attributes to be whatever parameters we want them to be. Rotate is our rotation variable. And I found position equals top, V center to be B box, to be the way that it best positions them around the circle without colliding into anything. So some examples that I put together for this. First of all, if we could take a quick look, this is percent Circos macro call. It only has three required parameters, so your data just has to be structured to have a before and an after group. So the example data that I had when I first started this was just two columns, there's an A, B, C, D, E, and an A, B, C, D, E, and just uh, whichever patient value had for start and it was just two columns. So pretty straightforward. Data is just whatever the data set name is. There's image options, so you can control your height and your width. Um, you can make a JPEG, PNG, TIFF, anything that you need. Um, Anti-aliasing and transparency. So the anti-aliasing is actually extremely important with this graph. Normally, it doesn't come up in a lot of curves. Anti-aliasing is how many points or objects in my graph can I have before it kind of runs out of memory and starts making everything look jagged. In this graph, we have potentially thousands and thousands of points to make these polygons, depending on your data. So being able to set anti-aliasing uh, higher could be very critical to making your graph look correct. You can output it to a document, so if you want to send it to an RTF or a PDF, HTML, Excel, whatever you're working with, you can do that. DPI for your resolution. Uh, controlling the appearance of the graph. Group gap is the gap between rectangles, so as you're going around the circle, you can either have all your rectangles connecting to each other if you set that to zero, or if you want some more space between them, you can buff increase that buffer size up. Bar width lets you set the width of the rectangles as a proportion of the unit circle. Inner gap is the gap between the inner circle and the outer circle. Start is where in the unit circle do you want to start? The graph defaults to the bottom of the curve, but you can always set it to be any point going around the circle. Direction is do you want it to go clockwise or do you want it to go counterclockwise? You can change font sizes, colors, weights, orders of the groups, colors of the groups, and there's also a, a way to subgroup down, which we'll see in, one of, in a, two of our examples here. So a basic example that you could actually take this home and you could run this if you wanted to. Um, I have a website that ha it's linked in the presentation where you can actually go and download the macro code if you wanted to try running this yourself or look at it. Uh, this just creates a randomly generated data set to make random before and after groups. Then we just plug that into the macro and we run it to get this. 
This one's designed to make it so our first three groups don't have any other paths entering them, and our last three don't have any groups uh, leaving them, just based off of the, the random number generator. And I'll point out in the bottom right corner, because I don't think I've pointed this out yet, that number, 1.92 paths per percent, is the only way I have to give a quantitative number to this graph. So it just means that each percentage point as you run around is equal to 1.92. Um, could be patients, could be observations, whatever is in your data set. So soccer players changing teams. So I found this data in one of Sanjay's Graphically Speaking. If you haven't looked at these blogs, there's a lot of helpful resources that are out there. They're made by Sanjay Matange, who I heard is sadly retired, if you're coming here. Um, this shows soccer players changing teams with certain regions or countries. And while again, it's not quantitative, it still can give us some fun information. For example, if you look at the USA, nobody's going to the US to play soccer, which I guess isn't a huge surprise to anyone. Um, surprisingly, a lot of people are leaving England to play in other countries. Um, a lot of people from Spain are going to Spain to play there instead of people leaving Spain. And a majority of the other countries are pretty well balanced of people leaving to go to other countries and other countries joining them to play soccer. So, I work in clinical oncology, so I wanted to pull an example to try to give some sort of a reference for some way that I could use a circus graph, because again, I just made this for fun as part of a, a group project, but I want to find some way to use this. So, in this case, I'm looking at maximum grade adverse events uh, for diarrhea in a uh, advanced colorectal uh, cancer trial. And the goal of this is to kind of see how are our grades distributed at these two different time points, so six weeks versus the entire length of treatment. And is there any kind of a surrogate or any kind of a surrogate uh, value that six, can six weeks predict what they'll have at, like, across their whole length of treatment? So sometimes we look at uh, analyses like this just to see if we can cut back on how long we can watch patients for, how long we can treat patients for, et cetera. In this case, we're using our subgroup variable, so now we're having kind of two circus graphs, one on the left, one on the right, connected to each other. On six weeks, if you we look at that, we can see almost half of our patients there did not have any diarrhea, so grade zero. With adverse events, the higher the number, the more severe the adverse event is, where five actually means death. Four is hospitalized, three is it severely impacts their lifestyle. So we have almost half of them didn't have it, majority of them had it as pretty much minor, and then there's a small group where they had severe adverse events. Now if we look at end of treatment, we can see that they become a little bit more balanced, where we have almost an even number at zero, one, two, and three, and we still don't have a lot of very severe adverse events. But what we can look at is it looks like almost 60% of the zero group stayed zeros, pretty much 60, 70% of grade one stayed grade ones, same thing with twos, almost all the threes stayed a three. So while it's not quantitative, there's no p-value, there's nothing like that, we can still kind of see a visual pattern in our data that most people kind of stayed in their six-week adverse event group. Now, this is actually a meta-study, which happens to have 47 studies in it, but I'm subsetting it down to just these six. Um, you can look at how patients are, are going from uh, six-week adverse events to the full treatment adverse events within each study. And one of the first things that we can see by subgrouping is that study three is gigantic compared to most of the other studies when it comes to sample size. But looking within, it can be a little bit tricky when you get down to the, the small to actually kind of pick out where people are going. But again, this is just a visual graph just to see what your data looks like it's doing. Um, we can see again that most patients seem to be staying uh, within their six week adverse event maximum grade versus the full treatment adverse event grade. Now within this macro, you can, I have made it so you can color 
each one of these studies, adverse events, different colors, or you can make them the same across each. In this case, it works better to have them all the same, so we know that grade zero is a grade zero without having to constantly look at the outside of the circle. So some other applications. So as I've been doing this, um, I kind of like to go out to communities.sas.com, which is another great website if you haven't been there yet. It's a forum where you can post questions. You can try to help other people answer their questions. There's articles on how to do cool stuff. I was surfing there at Pharmasug, and I came across these two potential um, graphs, pie charts and donut charts. They're generally very simple visual graphs, but SAS doesn't have a lot of options for these because they just don't do a lot with circular graphs, it seems, at this point. But the same trigonometry methods that I've been using to make the circus graph can be applied to make these graphs as well. So for the pie chart, so here's a basic pie chart. It's available in the graph template language with the region layout, which region layout is just a way to provide space. There's no x and y axis in there. And I think the pie chart's one of the only graphs you can actually put in that layout. It can't be combined with other graph types like text plot or um, scatter plot or anything. And there's very limited options to it. Now, this was the graph that somebody wanted to make. So they wanted to have two pie charts where the small groups that have 1, 6, 7% in this example don't look like small slivers, and he wanted to blow them up so he could look at their proportions in a second uh, pie chart. Now, you could potentially try to do this with uh, ODS, uh, making a lattice layout with two regions and putting two pie charts next to each other, but then the problem becomes how do you connect them to each other? Because he wanted those lines that made it look like you were blowing up one pie chart into the other. So there really wasn't a way to do that. And so I kind of took what I've been doing, and instead of drawing curved rectangles, I'm going to draw a wedge. Because this is another pretty straightforward shape that I didn't find any kind of plot statement to be able to do in SAS. Basically, all we have to do is do the outer part of our rectangle on the unit circle, and then we just put a point at the origin, and the polygon plot will connect everything, and we'll get our wedge. And we just keep adding wedges going around the circle, and we'll make our pie chart. But the difference between this one and those other ones is we have an x and y axis for this pie chart. So now we can actually go in and add any kind of graph that we want into this. Now, in order to make that second one, we go back to, again, do a, a little bit of math. And in order to translate or move a circle into another, another origin in the same space, we just go to each of the x coordinates, and we just add the same value to it. So Instead of having our origin at 0, 0 for the, like the left one, we want our origin to be at something like 3, 0 on the right. So we just add 3 to everything, and it just moves that second circle over. Then all I have to do is just find the start endpoints to that other group, the gray group, and just connect them to the top and bottom of the other circle. And then it looks like it's exploding out like I want. So donut chart is similar to a pie chart, but instead of wedges, we have rings. Um, again, this one has a kind of, a, I'm trying to remember what they call that, a sheen to it, because that's what the user was trying to match what the, they have, but you can make it flat, anything like that. So it's similar to a pie chart, it has multiple rings. I haven't seen anything in SAS that makes a donut plot, at least in the SG procedures, which is what I use. You can use the circus outer rectangle methods and just use them at multiple distances to draw these. So in this case, I'm going do uh, j from 1 to 2, or how many rings that you have. And the key part to look at for this is the green text, if you can read that out there. Um, so each loop is essentially going to draw the next rectangle uh, 0.3 proportion closer to the origin. First one, j will be 1, so I'll get rid of that, and I'll draw it on the unit circle, and it'll just work its way in. And then we just use group equals ID in our polygon plot to color them differently. And we have the donut plot. So in conclusion, generating circular plots is possible with trigonometry functions. The current methods are really inefficient. Um, they could be improved with the addition of a polar axis if, if SAS wanted to develop that. Circus plots are a powerful visual tool. I don't think they're meant to be quantitative, but 
They can be pretty and shiny, put on things like posters. Um, they can be versatile to situations outside of genomics. And everything is available if you follow this link, which I think if you have the app, you can actually pull up my slides and click on that, or just search SAS communities for percent circus and You'll find an article that I wrote that has the background of everything I just talked to, my PharmaSug paper, the program itself, and some examples, or at least one example in there. So thank you for coming to my talk. Um, I, I need to remind you to complete your session survey uh, inside the app. If you have any questions for me on anything, you can just walk up to the microphones and feel free to ask. Don't mind going back to any of the slides if you have a question on something specific, so thanks again.